Hi guys. Today we're going to be talking about igneous rocks, including how they form, where they form, and how we classify them, as well as the Bowen's Reaction Series. Okay, this is a beautiful picture of a volcano, and if you know anything about igneous rocks, you'll know why that has to do with it. And if you don't know anything about igneous rocks, you are going to figure out why volcanoes have something to do with them. Igneous rocks in the rock cycle. So I included this diagram in my rock cycle video. If you haven't seen it, go watch that first. It's a good primer for these rock type videos. I just repeat it here just in case you have forgotten what the rock cycle is or where the igneous rocks lie in the rock cycle. And this is where cooled magma is igneous rocks. But there are different processes that can make this happen. Here you can see that igneous rocks are forming at the mid-ocean ridge to the left of the figure and the volcanic arc to the right of the figure. These are two different scenarios. At one, you have a divergent oceanic plate boundary. The other, you have a subduction zone where oceanic lithosphere is subducting under continental lithosphere, causing heating and melting of the magma below the continental lithosphere, and this is causing volcanic activity. Now, in both of these scenarios, the igneous rocks are forming from coming up and cooling at the surface. However, there is another really important process in which igneous rocks form and if you've ever seen a granite countertop you've seen the product of this additional process that I'm going to tell you about on the next slide. One of the main things we use to classify igneous rocks is whether they cooled fast or cooled slow. So how can we tell that Rachel? Well it's not that difficult. Here I'm going to explain the processes in which igneous rocks can either cool fast or slow and then I'll explain the differences in the rocks that form from these processes. You can see here a volcano is coming up and erupting and lava, which is what we call magma that's now at the surface and cooling, is flowing out of this volcano. This lava flow is going to cool into igneous rock and this rock is cooling quickly because it's cooling at the surface and so it's going to have a different texture than rock that cooled beneath the surface. So you can see this pinkish purple igneous pluton here to the lower right. This is a pluton which is just a body of igneous rock coming up but not forming a volcano. It's coming up slowly and cooling slowly but underneath the surface. So it's going to be cooling very slowly rather than quickly at the surface because the temperature difference is not as extreme as eruption from a volcano. So this process of cooling slowly is going to make the igneous rocks that form from these processes have different textures than the ones that cool fast. We distinguish these two types of igneous rocks, whether it cooled fast or slow, by using these terms, extrusive and intrusive, or volcanic and plutonic. It's pretty easy to remember because those that cooled quickly at the surface are extrusive or exited the crust and they're volcanic because this typically happens through volcanoes. And those that cooled slowly in the subsurface are termed intrusive, meaning they were still in the crust, they didn't exit out and in a pluton, so plutonic. Now the way that we know how the rock cooled is grain size. So the grains are a lot coarser in slowly cooled rocks or plutonic rocks and the grains are a lot finer in rock that cooled quickly. And this is because rock that cools quickly, like basalt coming out of a mid-ocean ridge or rhyolite erupting from a volcano, this does not allow the mineral grains to nucleate for a long time, meaning they can't grow big. But magma that's cooling really slowly in a pluton under the surface has a lot of time to form really big crystals. And so this is what we call coarse grain because we can see the grains, whereas something fine grain like rhyolite or basalt, we can't see the grains with our eyes, not as easily as with grain and Gabra. Now, if you don't know what these rocks are, we're going to get into that in just a second. But basically, the cool thing about the rocks on this slide are that granite and rhyolite are the same composition. The only difference between the two is the grain size because granite cooled slowly and rhyolite cooled fast. They look so different, but they're the exact same chemical makeup. Same thing with gabbro and basalt. They're the same composition, but they formed in different cooling regimes. Another way we distinguish igneous rocks is by their color, but not necessarily their color. So basically, you can see that the rocks on the left are very light in color, and the rocks on the right are very dark in color. This may seem like we're distinguishing by color, but what this really is, is silica content. We term these light-colored rocks felsic, and it's because they have really high silica content. 
whereas these rocks on the right are dark in color because they have low silica content, and we term this mafic. And this is a really fundamental way that we classify igneous rocks, whether it's felsic or mafic, or in between, which we call intermediate. There's also a term called ultramafic, which is even lower silica content than what we deem mafic, but we won't discuss that in too much detail in this lecture. So the last thing I want to discuss is the Bowen's reaction series. This always used to confuse me when I had it explained to me in class, maybe because I wasn't fully listening, but I'm going to try and explain it here in a very brief way, just to introduce the gist of the series. Basically, it's pretty simple when you think about it. As magma cools, different minerals precipitate out of the magma at different temperatures. And this happens in an order that never changes. So it's pretty useful when you're trying to determine what temperature the magma cooled at to form what minerals. So you can see here the temperature goes down as we go down the reaction series. The first mineral to precipitate out of really hot magma will be olivine, and as the magma cools further, it will be peroxine, it will be amphibole next, and then biotite. And this is as the magma cools. Then if it cools even further, you're going to get potassium feldspar, muscovite, and then finally quartz. There's another branch on the right side, which is just in regards to the mineral feldspar and it's whether you have calcium-rich or sodium-rich feldspar. Calcium-rich feldspar precipitates out at a higher temperature, and then as you cool the magma further, sodium-rich feldspar precipitates out. But the very last three minerals are always potassium feldspar, muscovite, and quartz. And you can probably tell because we defined quartz as silica in the mineral episode, that the silica content is increasing down this series, and you are correct. So you're getting more felsic as you go further down the series. So when you talk about rock type in this series, you can see that the first ones to precipitate out have the least silica content and are termed ultramafic. And this example of this kind of rock is peridotite, which has a lot of olivine, which makes sense because we see that at the top of the series. Then you get to your mafic rocks like gabbro and basalt, which we saw in the previous slides. And these have a lot of peroxine and amphibole in them. Then you get to your intermediate or andesite, and it says diorite here. Diorite is just the coarse grain version of andesite. We talked about cooling slow or fast, so diorite is the intermediate igneous rock that cools slowly, and andesite is the intermediate igneous rock that cools fast. And intermediate is just the term used to describe their silica content. Lastly, in this series, you get down to felsic or something like granite and rhyolite, which we saw in the previous slides as well. And those are the rocks that have the most silica content or quartz in them. And we can tell this by looking at their color. Now, the color is the first thing we look at. We can be more specific if we do an actual chemical composition analysis, but typically we're pretty confident because the color change is pretty specific with silica content changes. That is it for this video. To review the main points we made, we talked about how two main ways to distinguish igneous rocks are whether they're intrusive or extrusive, or whether they're mafic or felsic, or anything in between. And the Bolin's reaction series defines the temperature at which we get certain minerals precipitating out of magma, and therefore also defines the temperature at which we'll get certain types of rocks precipitating out of magma. And these rocks will be differentiated based on their silica content, as this has the most direct relationship to temperature. So I hope you guys learned a lot about igneous rocks, and I hope that I'll see you next time for sedimentary rocks.